we go across the world and ask people from all different types of backgrounds the same question. Are you happy? Good, how are you? Good to meet you, buddy. Theo. Good to meet you. What's your name? Nikki. Nikki, good to meet you. How's it going, sir? Good, how are you? Theo. Huh? Theo, very good to meet you. Oh. How are you? Good, yourself? Good, I'm alright. Uh, you okay with being on camera? Yeah. Alright, good. Yeah. What's your name? I hope you your camera is standard because every time someone takes my picture, it breaks the lens. Oh, it breaks the lens, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine with it. Yeah, good. What's your name, Theo? Theo, yeah. Huh. Easy to remember. Yeah. How's your day going? Pardon? How's your day going? Quiet. Nice and quiet. Yeah? Peaceful. That's what an old guy like me likes. Peaceful, no stress. And like the young people here with the stress. Yeah, yeah. I don't need it. Well, what do we want to do here? And by the way, you have bottled water if you need it. Oh, yeah, actually, I will take a bottle of water. Yeah. If you give me that. Thank you very much, man. Yep. Oh, anyway. Is there one for you as well? No, I don't no, thank you. You sure? Positive. Absolutely. I'm all set. I drink tap water. Yeah? <laughs> I don't bother with bottled water. I save it for you young people. Alright, I'm just going <laughs> to place a microphone here right, right on I'm, this side. I'm oh, just going to place a microphone. You're fine as you are. Um, you've been living in Shelton a long time? All my life. Really? All my life. All 77 years. Of course, I was born in Derby at Griffin Hospital. Other than that, I've lived in Shelton all my life. You like Shelton? I love it. People are nice. I'm so used to it, too. It'd be hard for me to get out of here. Yeah, I was born in Derby as well. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how much they told you about what we got going on here. But um, basically what I do is I travel around the world and ask everyone I meet if they're happy. Oh, uh, are you happy? Yes, very much so. Yep. I'm a happy old man. I'm not even that old anymore. Say that again? I said I'm a happy old man, but not really that old anymore because 77, I still got a lot of years ahead of me. 30 years ago, I wouldn't say that if I were 77. What do you mean? Because the lifespan is greater now. When I was in, back in the 1960s, when a person lived into their mid to upper 70s, they were old. Now, people live into the 90s. I hear it on my scanner. They live to 100, 101, and still calling an ambulance because they don't feel well. And that's it. You know, it's just amazing the lifespan today. Should be wide because I'm already getting the shot. Um, you said, uh, a lot of people I ask are say they're struggling to be happy. No, it's not a struggle. You just kind of block out the stresses. You deal with the stresses, but you don't let them take over. I mean, I've had stresses all through my life, but I got through them, and I'm still a happy man. Happy to be alive, happy to have nice people around me. You know, the whole nine yards, all that. It's just a nice thing. If you don't mind me asking, what sort of stress is... Um, really like everyday stuff. Maybe bills, maybe someone that you're close to gets sick or dies or whatever. That's all. No big stresses. I think years ago, my, our biggest stress we had when we had the house and we had to foreclose. But it really wasn't stressful either. It was kind of a relief. Because then we didn't have the mortgage anymore. What happened with that foreclosure? Uh, we broke even. Okay. We broke even That's and good. it worked out well. You know, with the purchase, because the, the bank sold the house and it, everything broke even, lawyers' fees and everything. Um, if you had a message for the entire world, what would that message be? For the entire world or from? 
for the entire world, if you had a message, if you could speak to the entire world, say millions of people are going to see this, what sort of message would you like to part on to them? Well, support President Trump. <laughs> I'm really big for President Trump. I would push for support all the way around from other countries too. That's great. What would you say to somebody who's uh, struggling to be happy? Well, if there's, I would ask them if there was anything I could help with. Otherwise, I'd tell them I'd pray for them. Right. I'm so sorry. Could you give me your name again? Lou. Lou. Louis, Louis, whatever you want. How, you said you're how old? I'm uh, 77. I just turned 77 in June. Wow, I actually just interviewed somebody who was 77. It's yeah. a coincidence. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. That's sure. it? Oh, no, we got, we got a little oh, more. Oh, I thought you were giving up already. No, no, are you kidding me? <laughs> I just I appreciate your appreciate your time. Sure, no problem. I have nothing to do anyway. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a retired man. I sit upstairs, listen to my talking books. Sometimes I come down here when the sun's not too bright. Sit out here and just relax all the time. During the, today, I'm fine at home. When my which now my daughter-in-law works. Can you plug this in. My son is at work, so I go to Newtown four days a week now to take care of two of my grandchildren. You take care of the grandchildren? Two of them. Okay. Have seven and 13. Can't leave the 13 alone too long at that age without their parents okay, getting wait, in trouble. Know, um, where I, can plug this, I have to plug this charger in. For his, um, I'm yeah. sorry? Is there somewhere I could plug this charger in? An outlet in the wall? Is there an outlet in the wall? Like Out here? Through? No. Uh, I don't even have a long extension unless you want to bring it upstairs and plug it yeah. in the kitchen yeah, until you're done. That's fine. Go upstairs inside the door. Um you said you were you listened to uh audiobooks. Yes. Um are you legally blind? Oh I'm more than legally blind. You're I'm blind. blind. Oh, I yes? can't see anything now except a lot of light. Now and then I think I see an image moving or something, but that's it. I'm, I'm basically blind. For years I was just legally blind. And that wasn't declared until 1972 or 3, when I, just before I uh, worked at the coffee shop in Bridgeport. I got, it, got set up, it was set up by the state service for the blind, and I ran the coffee shop for over 41 years. Mostly by myself. You ran the coffee shop? Yes. Wow. It's set up for, it was set up for a blind person, legally, legally blind, mostly self service. I made, had to make sure the coffee was made and everything was kept clean and everything. Uh, refrigeration and up to par. And I kept busy. Of course, like I said, I was just legally blind then, so I could see what I was doing. And because I had all that vision, I know what I'm doing now with cleaning and whatnot. You know, I know what to feel for and whatnot. And it just works out well. Because I even, I do some cooking now, not much. I guess too, I get too tired if I cook anything big. <clears throat> and, but well, since I've left work, oh wow, back in two, five years ago, I go to church every morning when there's mass. And I walk up the church and right up the street anyway. And I have some adventures on my walk sometimes. If I'm not paying attention, I get lost in the or disoriented. Wind up in the middle of the street. <laughs> Somebody always comes to my rescue though. <laughs> Has that happened to you before? Oh, many times. Really? Oh yeah, many times. In fact, the first one significant time that I remember getting lost, but not even on the street. When we lived down the street, I had some vision. This was 10, 14 years ago. And it was winter time and it snowed. I always liked to help to land, help the landlord with shoveling. I got out into the yard with the snow shovel. Everything was covered quite well with snow. I got lost in the yard. <laughs> a 
fortunately, the landlord happened to come out his door. I says, Richard. He goes, what's, what's up, Lou? I says, I'm lost. <laughs> he knew what to do right away. He just told me, I, I says, just tell me which way to go to find the walk, the walkway. As soon as I felt it under my feet, I said, okay, I got it now. Uh, you weren't you weren't born blind though, right? I was born with retinitis pigmentosa. Okay. It's a hereditary eye disease. And how did that affect your uh, childhood? How did that affect you growing up? Uh, growing up, as far as playing with other kids and everything, they were fine. It was fine. Schooling was the problem. Seeing the boards, seeing the things I wrote on and whatnot, and uh, I struggled through grammar school because well, I went to a parochial school and the parochial schools aren't geared up for special ed. So they showed little sympathy for me and pushed me further than they probably should have as far as my grades and whatnot, pushed me upward. but. Uh, I did okay, all things, because I learned a lot. I remember a lot of stuff, you know, through life. I remember, oh, I learned that in such and such a grade. So I paid attention in school. But uh, as I got into high school, which that's when I regretted being in grade school and a parochial school, because I was not accepting extra help. I wanted to be mainstream like I was all my younger, all my previous years, and I did it successfully. Why, what was the reasoning behind the decision to quit school? To quit. I, I wasn't keeping up with my classes. I, actually, I was not very smart about it. I should have accepted, if I accepted extra help, which was offered to me, I probably would have stayed right until graduation day. But I quit at the end of my sophomore year when I turned 16. And that was it. I, then yeah. I, for years, I went without the rest of the education. Then I went to adult education. And what are some uh, misconceptions you feel like people have about people who are blind? Fortunately, not too many anymore. Okay, good. There was. Ex uh, sympathy. Mm -hmm. Rather than reasoning or understanding or helping, it was sympathy. Oh, the poor thing can't, can't do it because he's blind. Which, personally, I proved to a lot of people I could do it just by working at the coffee shop. Even le just legally blind. But people supported me for that reason. Here I was working with my impaired vision and there's other people healthy and not wanting to work. They want to collect all that. And people, you know, with good common sense could see the difference. And people I worked around at the federal building were that way. They were decent people. Where do you get your work ethic from? Well, I, when I was a kid, I worked. Okay, plus my father instilled a lot in me as far as you know, obeying rules and regulations and, you know, someone, you know, you work for someone, you just do what you're told. Plus, growing up as a child, you're obedient to your parents, you do. Never really fought. We had little disagreements and it was settled and that was it. You know, no fighting amongst us, myself and my sisters. How are you and your sisters now? Are they we get along still alive? Right. Yeah. One of my sisters is Griffin's grandmother. I'm sorry? Griffin's grandmother is one oh, of my sisters. Okay. I feel like there's, um, you know, I, basically what I do is I, everywhere I travel, I've been traveling across the country. Across the country? Yeah. Okay. California to New York. Wow. And basically, I stop in every state I pass through. And I do interviews just like this. Good. Um, and when I first started, 
it was before this uh, pandemic. Yes. And uh, it was, you know, it had its own. People had their own complaints, um, but now I feel like everyone I run into, um, they're they claim they're not happy because of everything that's happening in the world. A lot of death, a lot of injustice, according to them. Um, but you seem you seem to have a very positive affect about life. How do you maintain positivity um, when times are hard? Not necessarily what's going I, on in the world. I, I pay attention to what's going on around me. Mostly, my well, mm. it helps because my my son Robert, uh, my son Greg, my stepson Roy, my daughter. We all are close in many ways, and they're good to me. Uh, you know, just people around me are just decent. It doesn't give me any reason not to be happy. Yeah. You know, I feel bad for people who aren't happy. And by and large, the happiest people I have spoken to, the common thread between them is family. Yes, absolutely. If you have family, you can be a happy person. I mean, family that's really family, not one here and one there. So it means it's just including marriage, I think, is important. What's that? Marriage. You know, the young people, you know, getting together and having children, and if even if they're not married, at least if they live together with the children, you know, the, the father and the mother, it makes a difference. It helps build a family that way. Or when it's a single parent, whether it be male or female. It's tough on everybody around them. Other relatives, their own feelings, their children's feelings. I feel like we're losing that? Yes, I do. When I hear so much what's going on with young people. There are very few ma marriages anymore, weddings. At churches or at... Uh, the only time you really hear about a lot of or a lot of marriages when it's happening out of amazement. In other words, certain types of people getting hooked, getting married and whatnot. You hear a lot about that. But as far as local close marriages, family, it's so few and far between lately. How long have you been married? Uh, got married in 72. Uh, my wife died 17. Years ago, from I'm diabetes. Say that again. My wife passed away oh. 17 years ago from diabetes uh, complications. Sorry to hear that. yeah. Um, that's that's a very long marriage. Yes. What uh, what's the secret? Well, I don't know. We just were compatible, I guess, and we didn't fight. You know, we had our disagreements. And mainly we try not to settle them in front of the children. And then we would sit down and just talk it out, whatever one or the other's gripe was, and we just straighten it out and come to agreements. And no marriage runs smoothly, totally. Behind closed doors you don't know what goes on. But for the most part, I mean, recently I heard of a, for, what the heck was it, it was on the radio. More than 60 years married. That's a long time. And we probably would have done that if my wife didn't pass away. But I had no desire to find another wife. I felt I wouldn't find one like her. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Because when we first met even, I I was out of work, no, was I out of work? Yes, I was out of work at the time because of the factory closed. And I was getting so sick. I was getting unemployment. And then that ran out and I was getting, and I went to social security disability. And when I met my wife, of course she was married already. But things didn't work out with that marriage and the next thing you know, we were together. And uh, things were well for us. And myself, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem. And I really believe she gave it to me, the self-esteem. She 
to us if there's something you want to do. Because said, we bought a house. I said, I don't know, you know, as far as repairing things, she goes, if, if you want to try something, you do it. If you can't do it, then you ask for help. But she pushed that all the time for me to, <clears throat> for me to do. You could do it. And close relatives of mine on my side of the family, I think they did not agree with her thinking. Why is that? Because they thought that I should be catered to. Everybody do for me. And I'm not like that. I like to do. In fact, even before I met my wife, I worked <coughs> I worked in a television appliance store. Hmm. And back then, in the 60s, it was TV antennas. And I used to install those, going up on roofs. And you could do that even with the visual impairment? Yes. Well, I had a lot of vision, thank God for that. I knew colors, I could see things, especially up close. The reading I had a hard time with, and really I had, a, had the thing real close to my face to see to read. But I did that. I, I did a heck of a lot of stuff. Delivered appliances and TVs, of course, would help. Just two of us would go on a delivery, two of us would go on a, an antenna installation. And if you want to hear a hairy story, I can tell you one. Yeah, just keep it wide, the on the whole time. Doing antenna work, we were at this nice big house. It was a two and a half story, you know, a nice big peak roof, full size house, and chimney right in the middle of the peak, right at the top of the peak of the chimney. And the people, and back then, we, when we put up TV antennas, a lot of people wanted the rotary to turn it with a dial on top of your television. So right. we installed the TV antenna with, with the rotor on it, which brought it up about 15 feet. And we mounted it against the wall, against the chimney. Okay. We had a special procedure to, to do it correctly, not to strain the roof or the uh, chimney. And, uh, <coughs> and we're both working at it. Beautiful September day. And uh, I decided, well, we decided we'd get it done and get off the roof quickly. So we had a nice big job, ready to get off the roof. And my partner, who happened to be my brother in law at the time, uh, looked up and saw the guide wires. One of the guide wires were kinked. One of the guard wires were what? Kinked. Kinked. Okay. Like got it. Got yeah. it. So we couldn't leave it like that because it was strong wind snap it. A strong wind would snap it. So we had no alternative. So we have to take the whole thing down, just you know, lower it just to be able to straighten that one guy wire. Nope. I put it in the tunnel, went down to the truck, picked up, grabbed the step ladder, straddled it on the peak of the roof against the chimney. You know, didn't extend it, just leaned it against the chimney. I got up on the chimney, and he got up on my shoulders, and I stood me on the antenna pipe. <laughs> and the boss showed up. I turned my head, I see where he parked it, I see the nose of his car. He got out of the car, and he comes around the front, he looks around to see where we were, and he looked up and saw us on top of the chimney, with my partner on, on my shoulders. He covered his face, he got back to the car. He didn't want to watch us. And we got it done all right. Got off the chimney and then he attempted to uh, you know, scold us not to do that. He couldn't stop laughing because of the way it looked. And the only thing I regret about that is he didn't have a camera. I really wish to this day <laughs> that he had taken our picture. It would be one picture to show. Speaking of regret, that's an awesome story, by the way. Yeah. Speaking of regret, um, what are some things, you know, looking back in your life, you wish you might have done differently? Or do you live with no regrets? I don't have anything serious to regret. Uh, no little thing, I wish I did this, I wish I did that. Uh, no, now and then, well, a few years ago, I spoke to someone who was basically a drunk. 
drinking all the time. He had problems. But he'd come and talk to me, or be a nuisance talking to me, say stuff that didn't make sense. And one time he came to the top of my street, was about five or six years ago. Maybe we were worried about that. And I told him, you know, I don't like it that you're drinking. Come back another time. Instead of saying, come, go home and sober up, and come back, I'll talk to you again once you're sober. I left that out. The following two or three days later, after I sent him away, he died. And that is just something I regret sending him away so quickly without telling that to Say again, sorry, a car was driving by. Uh, something you regret is what? Is, uh, say, he you came, found out he, he passed away? He passed away okay. two or three days after I sent him away from home. Uh, and before that, I, after when I found that out, I realized I should have followed up with his baby. I'm thinking maybe it could have helped him get away from the drinking. It was actually, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one of my niece's ex-husband. And uh, yeah, two, two or three days later, it was, he died. And he lived across the street on the other side of Holly Avenue. You know what? Are there any more bottles of water in there? I throw it to you and try it. You expect to talk it so much. <laughs> Thanks. I got it. Okay. It's crazy how we never know. Uh, we never know the last time we're going to speak to somebody. Right. And that really taught me a lesson, not to turn anybody away so harshly. It really bothered me, it still does today. It's just, I think about it now and then, I wish I could have done the right thing. But that's all, you know, that's all with it is. <clears throat> and I've had people... Bad. Because, now supposing you said something to me today that I didn't like. And I held it inside. I didn't say anything to you to do anything. Uh, but after you left, come on, oh, that guy that was here, he said such and such. But before I even think of that, if you asked me something that I didn't like, I would just tell you, I can't answer that or I won't answer it. Rather than talk to someone else about it. You just, you just don't do that. It's not a nice thing to do. In fact, my father always installed in me. He always told me, you know, never try to have to say it. Remember, if someone's mad at someone else and they're telling you about it, don't accept their story. If you don't hear the other side, then you basically forget about what they said. You can't do anything about it, so forget about it. And another thing, there's something I grew up with, uh, as far as talking about people. Mm -hmm. And he said, especially with girls. He says, as I grew up, he told me as I grew up that I'd you know, be going out with girls and women. And he says, never tell anyone else how intimate he got with someone. There's no one else, mm -hmm. no one else in business but your own. And no one else has to know because then you're putting that person down that you spoke about. So, stuff like that. Never strike a woman, which I never have, which I'm glad. I never had the desire to hit a woman. Given, given your life experience, uh, mother, you know, we'll start wrapping it up since I... I'm sure I'm sure I'll see you again yeah. sometime soon um, but if you if this was the last time we ever spoke um, what, what sort of message would you want to leave behind with your life with everything you've lived what's what's something you wish what's uh, other people yeah other people would know uh, mainly not to put other people down 
accept people the way they are, no matter the color, your attitude, or whatever. Because sometimes you run into someone who could, who could come across to you very harsh. And I've run into this many times, even my work, when someone comes in and they have an attitude. I block it out. No attitude. I just treat them like they treated any other customer. And because I figure they've had they're either having a bad day or something bad happened to them, and I let it go. No, it's not for me to judge that. How do you how do you judge somebody's character? When I when I look at somebody, I like automatically I have to see what they look like. Yes. Thank God. In some ways. That's strange, but I can't judge a person by their body language. going through something like even yourself you you're doing this you like doing it it sounds like yeah and uh, I hear nothing wrong with what you're doing you know in your voice or anything you're right into it and you just get to read people better when you can't see them the real person yeah. you see with, within the person rather than exterior Like I said at the beginning, I was recording it on camera. Uh -huh. I'll post it to the internet. And who knows? Millions of people will probably watch it and they'll know of a man named Lou and Shelton. And Good. Maybe. And your story. Your maybe message. some people locally will see it too. Yeah. But okay, anyway, you came here with besides Griffin and Nicole? Yeah, I came with my brother. Oh. He's friends with uh, Griffin here. Oh. Yeah, we, we had a drive one time. Yeah. Griffin was driving me to work. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah. DeBron, you said, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah, a lot of people answer the question, are you happy? You're kind of like, oh, how's it going? Everybody's going to say good. Did you say you're actually happy? Yep. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm alive, I'm well, I have my health. I have nothing to be unhappy about. I love it. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Yeah. I appreciate my it. My pleasure. All right. Anytime. Thank you. And you too, LeBron. Thank you. And who else is here? Nicole. Oh, Nicole. Okay, sorry about that. And and uh, and Griffin. Yep. I always want to call you Brandon. <laughs> but anyway, both of you. Handshake, Thank you. my little friend. Thank you for uh, <laughs> taking your time. Yeah. Anything. Hey, I don't mind. Yeah. I'd make time for you know if I was busy, I'd make time for it. Yep. You know, it's something constructive. Yeah, I appreciate so, it. Yeah. You all come in. You didn't all come in one car. I take no. It. No, that's good. It's kind of warm for that. <laughs> and you know, when you told me you know we'll be outside doing this, uh -huh. it didn't dawn on me why you wanted to do it outside. Yeah. Uh -huh. then, then after I'm laying down and I went to bed that last night, said, oh, because of the corona. <laughs> you know, we're not all crowded in the room. Uh -huh. So it, you know, it's just don't even think of it. You know, I very rarely wear my mask. Yeah. Even the store around the street here, yep. I don't wear. Really? They ever say anything? No, they accept it. In fact, they call me Uncle Lou. Really? Aww. Yeah, they're, they're Indian. Oh, really? They're, they're from India. They're original, the owners of that place. Yeah, I'm Uncle Lou when I go there. You know, when I, if, I happen, if I should happen to call, looking for something in particular, 
Hey, hey, this is Uncle Lou. <laughs> and it's usually the, the young owner. Uh, and he answers, his name is Ishan. No, nice young man. Uh, going on 30 years old, I think. But he's been there for quite a while. But, but people are just, you know, I, what can I say? Uh, so what are you kids up to? People are a lot kinder than than one might think. I think people are, people are most people are kind. Most people you, you run into... Yes, I understand what you're saying. They're not, they're not accepted anymore. They're just almost like for themselves only. I mean, if you, if you look at the TV, uh, or if you listen to the news or whatever, um, you get this impression that everything is bad everywhere. Yes. Yep. And, and people are horrible. But in, in reality, you go out and people are nice. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Wherever I go, I don't have any problem with anyone. You, know, you follow the rules. You know, you're going to the store. You need to wear the mask. Just get my that. charger. What all else? Right. That's all. What else can I tell you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Lou. Yeah, my pleasure. Keep you smiling, day, kids. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Nicole. Bye. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, I need to go get oh, this yeah, charger. What about you, Nicole? Would you say you're happy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What makes you happy? Uh, my family and my friends. Everybody seems nice to me, but it's still not to be happy about. It's things Are you good you happy? me. Of course I'm happy. Going on in government. Happy every day. But what are you going to do? You know, you your life what makes you happy, girlfriend? Friends, family, sports, yeah. everything. I'm happy every day. <laughs> happy to be alive. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, you have a good day, all right? Yeah, you too. I'm I'm cool. 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 Cool.